This is Taylor, and Taylor has a little separation anxiety. So in this video, I'm gonna go over some tips and tricks that you can use if you have a dog that has separation anxiety. Now, um, uh, when it comes to dogs, uh, when, now these are both rescue dogs. The Guardians are doing a great job. They're two uh, Wheatons. There's another one uh, named Max who you won't see in this video probably. Uh, but basically, uh, it, uh, he is, and he, one other thing I'd like you to notice, see how far back his ears are? That can be an indication I'm a little bit insecure. Um, and so make sure you don't ever pet an insecure dog. If you ever see his tail going straight down or, you know, you tell he's uncomfortable, you can lay your hand on him, but again, don't pet him. So, um, all right, so a lot of us, um, when we have, uh, these are rescue dogs a little bit different, but a lot of us, if we get a puppy, the puppy comes home with us and then eventually we have to go to work. Well, when this puppy's born, it's with its siblings and its mother, and then it's with the breeder family. And so there's always a constant uh, living presence. Then we adopt the puppy, take it home, it's new and shiny and we're with it and it sleeps with us and all this. And eventually the honeymoon wears off and we have to go to work. And we go to work, yes, I know, yeah, I had treats and you're gonna get a lot of them. And we put the dog in a kennel or a long term refinery, area, which is what we prefer, um, or whatever it is, and we leave. And that's very likely the first time in that puppy's entire life it's completely absence of another presence. And that's unnerving. Now dogs can have separation anxiety being uh, separated from uh, anyone. Sometimes having another dog or person will suffice. Some dogs get separation anxiety if a certain specific person isn't there. And I think he's transitioned from that. Yes, I know you're gonna get a lot of treats, I promise, buddy. Um, so basically, uh, what, I've, uh, what I've got, uh, what I've learned to do with separation anxiety is kind of a two-part plan. First of all, you wanna desensitize the dog to the, what we call the triggers, the things that the dog associates with, that are uh, associated with you leaving. Um, and then number two, I want them to practice being alone in an easier capacity. If, I, if he's with me 24 seven, and then I leave, he goes from 100% access to me to zero, and that's just the biggest gulf there is. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is uh, desensitizing. So um, a lot of times when dogs have separation anxiety, recognize that we're leaving long before we actually go out the door. And so basically, and the guardian here mentioned that, there's a, she can sit in a certain place, put a certain pair of shoes on, and he starts getting a little bit nervous and anxious. Sometimes they'll drool, they pace, um, sometimes uh, you know, they bark, they run away, because they think, I'll just run and hide under the bed, you can't leave, because I'm hiding under the bed, you can't put me in the kennel. So he's kind of begging for some attention now for Taylor in a kind of a cute way. Um, so basically what we want to do is we want to desensitize them. And uh, I thought I had my keys there. But basically what you want to do is keys are a big one. The jingling of the keys, now it's an auditory sound as well as they see it. And again, that becomes almost like a bell or a command word that I'm about to abandon you is how dogs kind of interpret it. So what you want to do is go over to where your keys are, pick up the keys and put them back down. And you do this at times when you're not planning on leaving. Now, what you might want to do is actually have your partner watch you getting ready to depart. So start it long before. Okay, so when I sat down in this particular location, the dog started pacing a little bit or started breathing a little heavy or it started drooling. Okay, so sitting down here is one of the things we need to work on. Sit, very good. That little jump tells me there's cortisol in his blood. That's a stress hormone. Don't ever pet, if you pet a dog and it jumps like that, you don't want to pet him. What you do is, like I talked about earlier, lay your hand. And also try to get in the habit of petting under the chin if you are in the petting zone so they have that confidence of having the nose in the air. So basically, uh, putting on your shoes, picking up your purse, your sunglasses, um, if you have a bag or things along those lines, those are all things that, that the dog associates with you leaving. We want to practice them independent of leaving and independent of each other. Crash. Um, so what we want to do is... Um, and do it at different times of day, different situations. So the idea is, it gets to the point where you pick up the keys and put them down, the dog's like, that, and like the head doesn't even get up. If I pick up key, her keys right now, the guardian's keys, I'm guarantee his head would come up. And he's probably snap around, probably run towards her, or wherever she, the keys are normally kept. So you wanna just keep on doing this and desensitize the dog until eventually you pick up the keys and it's like, keys don't mean you leave anymore. All right, so, uh, so make a list of all the triggers, and sometimes it's putting on a work uniform or sitting in a certain place or walking down the stairs or whatever it is. Um, so once you practice those things enough individually, then you start practicing them in concert. So you pick up the keys and pick up your purse and, put, and hold the keys put, or put them in your pocket, put your purse on your shoulder, and then take them both off and put them back down. And it, it, there's not a magic number. Keep practicing until the dog doesn't do that. And again, different times of day, a lot of repetitions are important. Okay, so that's desensitizing, which is really important. Another thing you can do, and this is somebody everybody's like, well, but it didn't work. 
exercising your dog before you practice these things before you leave can really help as well it's not going to fix the problem but it will give you a benefit or help you make it easier to fix the problem so it's an important part of the process if he's got his full capacity of energy he has a lot more spacing that he can do where if we deplete it okay so you exercise him and then you practice these activities so then uh until he gets to the point where he just we extinguish the trigger so the next thing i want to do is i'm going to show you how you can teach your dog to stay now, most people think of the stay as one activity, but it's actually three activities. Um, stay, I, we teach the stay for what we call the three Ds, it's in Delta. Dis, uh, duration, distance, and distraction. Most of us try to teach them all at the same time. Stay and we start walking away. Well, now I gotta stay and, for duration and distance, and then there's a bog barking, there's too much going on, I can't do it. If I'm gonna learn something, I wanna learn it in the easiest version possible. Once I have kind of a confidence in it, then I can start adding in the variables to make it a little bit harder, but I don't just dump all the variables. I add one at a time and I've set myself up for success. We need to do the same thing for the dog. So the first thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna show you how to teach your dog to stay for duration. And you should not move on to distance until you've get, achieved a minimum of three minutes. I usually like to see at least five minutes. I'm gonna repeat that again. You do not wanna add any distance whatsoever to get a minimum of three minutes at least five times in a row. We call it five for five. We, uh, so basically, um, and every time I tell people this, okay, what's up, when I get to 10 feet away, I'm like, did you get three minutes? No, don't go to distance. No, so no duration or no distance so you get duration, okay? All right, would you like a treat? He's like, I've been sitting here for a while. There you go. All right, so when I have treats, I'm gonna have uh, a bunch of them in my hand and I'm using high value training treats. And these guys are a little finicky. I'll split it in half. Would you like another one? Now, some dogs are actually, and, I, and Max might be in this category, where he actually is more interested in affection than he is uh, a treat. Or do we have to use some crack for you? You did respond to the crack a little bit better. All right, so what we're going to do is, I'm going to, first of all, I want you to notice that there's about three feet distance between my face and his face. A lot of people, when we tell the dog to stay, we want to use a hand signal. I use the, hands, the stop sign, which is pretty universal for all creatures. And a lot of people do it like this, stay. Well, if I want to do something, they're not saying stay in my face. I want it halfway distance between. So I punctuate by saying the command word when my hand gets halfway distance. So I'll show you, and I have treats in this hand. Stay, pull it back, and don't take eye, you can look at him, but don't lock eye contact the whole time. Count to three stay so i'm delivering the treat and the hand that was even a little bit too close for him but we're pretty close together remember the treat goes in the mouth first they hear the command word afterwards stay and since he's doing good he's nice and relaxed and some dogs would prefer to stay in a in a laying down position that's cursed. if you're starting to sit and he always lays down it's starting to lay down my dog quest i don't know why it took me a couple years to figure out he prefers he stays better in and down so just go with whatever's easier so now I'm waiting, and he's going to look back up at me. I say, stay. Now he's a nice, calm, and relaxed, balanced state of mind. If he was, if he's more excited, he probably would be having difficulty doing this. You want to be very methodical about increasing the distance. So that was like you know 10 seconds, and then 20 seconds, and then 30 seconds. And you might be able to go to three minutes or whatever right away. That's fine. Also, make sure you do don't just practice just here. Dogs don't generalize well. They need to practice activities all over the place. So practice over there downstairs, in the bedrooms, in the, in the Husker room, all over the place, basement. So he understands that concept is universal. So I do this in, as I call bookends or cycles. Now, because when we're doing this, we're usually gonna rep a lot of it. So I'm gonna do three stays, and then we need to come up with a release word. I'm gonna say the word release, but you can change the release, break, freedom. And then since you have two dogs, if you're gonna teach both dogs this, I would have each dog have its own unique word to release. I have four dogs. I say release, break, Freedom and parole. I like using fun command words. And both of you smile, and that's why I like using those. I can say parole, and my dog, Max, goes away, and the other three dogs stay in a stay, because that's not their release word. Okay, so I'm gonna do, th so, uh, I'm gonna do three treats, uh, three stays, and then a release. And what is attention? Stay. One, two, three, four, five. I'm only counting for the auditory purposes here. Stay. So while he, the treat goes in the mouth, he's looking at that hand, stay. Stay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Always break eye contact. Stay. So I start it and I stop it, each one. I'm gonna do one more. Stay, and I would count to 15. 
And again, looking around, and you could probably go in bigger steps for him. He seems to be, already has some of this concept down. So I get to 15, stay, and then I want to release him. So when I start each stay, I stay, well, I'll just release him here and I'll explain it. Now I'm going to put in context what this means. Release. So when he hears release, he has moved away from me and then he has the treat in his mouth and then he feels, uh, and he hears the command word. So eventually release means we are done with the activity. Now later on when he has this, what you're going to say is stay and then you do think, and then you say release. We're not going to practice five or 10 or 15 times. That's why we have a cycle. S stay to start it, one, two, three, four, five. Stay to finish that cycle that I either release or I started it by saying stay again. So each time you're going to say stay, you're going to hold up your hand two times. Does that make sense? I'm going to have you practice this in a sec, so it won't. Um, and then how many times you're going to practice? Then you throw the treat off to the side. He gets up and takes at least one step away. Then he gets the treat. So sit. So after, uh, and you want to get to the point where you can, and for him, since he's doing well, I'd like you to go to five minutes since he's pretty much got it. I think you should be able to get there pretty quickly. Different parts of your house. Once you can get the stay for duration, then we're going to start doing distance. So let's come over here. There you go. So I'm going to stand up and we might have some interesting camera work, but let's see here. There we go. Sit. And again, sit or down, whatever he likes to do. So now I'm going to be standing because I'm going to start incorporating distance. So I'm going to wait for him to uh, get his attention, say stay. I'm going to take one step back. I'm going to count one, two, one step forward, stay. Wait for him to finish chewing. When he gets done, he looks up at me. I'm going to do two steps backwards. I'm going to count to four. Stay. One, two. One, two, three, four. One, two. Stay. And then I would either start it up again, or I would throw the tree to the side and say we're done with the exercise. Now that Taylor is taking about a step there, and it's going to be a little bit darker here. I hate winter time. <laughs> Let's say that this couch represents a wall. You don't want to start moving out of line of sight because that's harder for the dog. If I can see you, and I'm 25 feet, but I can still see you, I feel confident. When you go out of sight, it's harder. So I want you to imagine that right here is a wall that goes up, so once I go back here, you won't be able to see me. So now I'd say sit, or down, or whatever it is. Stay, Let's, and I don't want you to do this until you can be about 15, imagine this is 15 or more feet away. So I'm, as I get 14, 15, I'm gonna go like this, he can't see me, and I walk all the way back to him and say stay. So the first time I move out of his sight, I only move out of his sight for a fraction of a second. The next time, a full second if, I, if he did well. And sometimes it helps if you have like a mirror or something here so you can see what he's doing kind of at an angle. Some people use security cameras or whatever it is or have somebody else in the room. If you're there checking, if I cough, that means he gets up. So if, anytime your dog, and I forgot to mention this, anytime your dog is practicing, whether it's duration, distance, or distraction, you want 100% success. If your dog gets up and moves away, it's called an auto, we call that an auto release. That means your dog failed. We wouldn't reward them for that, but that would tell me, let's say if I went from uh, 60 to 70 seconds and at 65 seconds he got up, then I would go back to like 63 seconds and practice a couple more 63s and then try 65 and then 67. Always back up a step so you have success and have three or four successes before you go back to that threshold again. Small steps are key. Anytime the dog fails, that tells us that we took too big a step and we didn't prepare the dog properly. So once you get to the point where you can be out of the dog's line of sight, uh, you want to gradually start elongating that. We like to get to the point where he could be out of sight, maybe up here when you're downstairs watching TV, and be able to get to the point where he can eventually stay there and you can watch a whole TV program for about 30 minutes and he's staying in the stay. Now, I'm not going to say you're going to use the stay. Well, and, and the last one is we want to stay for distractions. So maybe when uh, kids are uh, playing, you know, uh, snow, you know, uh, having a snowball fight or whatever, we practice in front of the front door, and he can. He, we're now we're staying for distance and duration and distraction. And first I do distance with distractions, or excuse me, duration for distractions. Then I do distance for distractions, and keep our practice until he is just rock solid. He's got this solid stay, and the stay means you stay until you hear the release word and nothing else. I don't care if there's an avalanche or a big bird runs through the house. I stay here until I hear the release word. The camera person has never watched Septimity Street, so she didn't get that particular joke. Yeah. All right, so basically once we can get to the point where you can have, you can be down there and he's up here for like 20, 30 minutes, now you're ready to start actually leaving. We've desensitized him, we've helped him practice being alone, but this is still pretty, and we've practiced with distractions, but it's still gonna be pretty hard when you leave. So the first time you leave, 
What I want you to do is when you leave, first of all, don't make a big deal out of it. Don't tell them goodbye. Don't say anything, just leave. So you pick up your keys, your purse, and just kiss your lovey if you want to. And then turn around and walk out, but don't say a word to the dogs. And what I want you to do is this is the door. I go to the door, I open it, do I close it, and I turn around and come right back in. I put my purse down, my keys down, I sit down and watch some TV. So I only leave for literally as long as it takes me to close the door and open it back up again. If we let him whimper and whine and scratch the door, he's practicing panicking. We have to practice being calm. That's why we help him practice being here. When he knows we're there, it's somewhere between zero and 100. I'm not next to you, but I know you're over there. I can smell you. I can hear you. And I, I heard the door didn't open, so I know you're still in the house. And I'm practicing being calm despite the fact that I'm not right next to you. In this case, it'll be really helpful because Max, the other dog, has gotten into it with him a couple times, and now Max is self-isolating. So this would be beneficial to put him in a stay, and then you can be down there petting Max, and Max gets that benefit of being some quality time with you without him. And he's not intimidating. He's intimidating to Max, but he's not trying to dominate Max. Max is just saying, if you're here, I'm out of here. So this will give Max some confidence. I can practice being with you, and that can help with his problems. So eventually, at first, it's one second, you close the door, then two seconds and three seconds, and keep on increasing that distance, uh, the duration, excuse me, when you're outside. But when you're doing this, don't leave. Just stand outside the door. Now, I'm guessing you guys go through the garage. And yet, well, when I go through the front door, he's okay. Okay. It's so like probably because when you go through the front door, you're just going to see the neighbor, you're grabbing the paper and you're coming right back in. He knows that. When you go through the garage door, ooh. So a couple of things. So at first you just go ahead and close the, open the door to the garage and close it and then come right back in. And then eventually you want to get to the point where you can go on the other side of the door and stay there for like a, like a minute or two. Now, you're not normally going to do that because then he's going to hear the vibe, feel the vibrations of the garage door opening. Yeah. So you want to start practicing that as well. So you go outside, close the door, and, and then press the garage door button. And as the garage door is coming up, you go back inside. You go back in the door into the house. And, and don't go pet him each time. Just go in and hang out. And the garage door is open. I've actually had some people do this, and they'll actually give the dog a uh, do you have a remote control for your dog garage door? So what you could do is actually, this is another little bonus trick, is so what you would do is when he hears the garage door, he panics because he knows that guarantee means you're leaving. Well, let's make that a positive. So what we want to do is take a high value training treat, press the garage door button, and as soon as it starts going, give him the treat. Now the garage door, if it's like most of it, it's probably going to take about 12 to 15 seconds to completely open. So what we're doing is he hears the sound hearing, but there's a treat in my mouth. At first, as soon as you click the button and he can hear it, then you give him the treat. After a while, it's you click the button to wait one second before you give him the treat, then two seconds. Eventually, he gets to the point you press the button, the garage door goes all the way up, then he gets the treat afterwards. And that's where that's the money zone. That's where you're gonna keep on doing this. Then you close it and it gets done closing and then he gets another treat. After a while, the garage door sound me and the vibration means I'm about to get a treat. Instead of being associated with you leaving, it's associated with a positive thing. This is the power of positive dog training. We're helping the dog understand and have a positive association with all the elements. But what we're doing is we're breaking them down into small individual steps and going at the dog's pace so that eventually when the garage door opens, by if he had a tail, it would be lagging and you know that he's happy and that's a positive thing for him. Um, once you get to the point, and then you, the next step might be that you go out there and open the garage door and then you start your car. But you don't back it out of the garage, you start it and turn it off and then come right back in. Next time you go and start it, wait one second and then come back in. Now, it would be nice if somebody's watching him inside, when you turn the car on, does he start pacing and drooling? If he does, then we back up and then we might do the same thing with the car. So you have somebody inside, okay, and you're talking to each other on the phone. Okay, get ready to start the car. Whoosh, treat. So now the car starting is now a positive association. So we're taking each individual element that is a trigger for him that helps him think that something's bad happening. Now the inside stuff, picking up the keys, we're just gonna desensitize him by practicing those because he can still see you. Well, when the stuff where he can't see you, like the garage door opening or the garage door closing or the car and the car door, that's also a trigger. So that might be something you need to practice on individually. So the idea is you break it down to small steps and practice over and over again. And then it's like, yeah, she does all these things, but guess what? She always comes back. And the guardian actually ironically said to me earlier today, but he always come back. So he would figure, I figured out he would know this, but he doesn't because he's, oh, she's doing this. And he's getting himself so worked up. And I had this happen to me the other day. I was so mad about something that I, it took, even though it took me a long time to settle down, even though I achieved what I wanted to do, it took me a while. If you have an argument with somebody, you have to go cool down. It's the same sort of principle, just a different sort of dynamic. So eventually if we do this right, 
he's just like relaxed and happy as a clam. And because the garage door opening means I get a treat, the door slam opening means I get a treat, the car starting means I get a treat. And eventually when you do start leaving, again, make it very short intervals, keep a chart. You know, first, maybe I just put the car back in, in reverse and I back up five feet and turn around and come back in, put it park, turn up, come back inside and sit down. So practice this when you have some time, it's gonna be a while before you can get in the car and actually leave. Now, in the meantime, when you do actually get in the car and leave, that's gonna be hard for him. It's gonna be practice of him freaking out. That's where your exercise really comes in. Also, he likes bully sticks. And every time, I you know, now after I touch him a couple times, he stops doing it, but he's jumping a lot. So he's got the cortisol as well, both the dogs do. And if you're stressed, you can stress out your dogs. So uh, maybe when you, uh, when you start leaving, we give him a bully stick. I would get the, I'm gonna give you a card to the green spot which you can get those bully sticks there. So give him one of those and let him really get into a chewing for five minutes and then you quietly leave. Maybe you already have the garage door open. So he doesn't even, he's preoccupied, he doesn't notice that you're gone. And then you can kind of do your thing without him practicing panicking and freaking out. Now this is a, a longer video than I intended to, on doing and this is kind of a comprehensive one, but and this is not something you're doing one sitting. This is gonna be a lot of practice over and over. So make yourself a, a list and just start writing those things down and just checking them off methodically. And if you do it right, like I said, the dog's confident about it and uh, doesn't associate with all the indication or the uh, uh, triggers that it actually means you're leaving. Uh, this is Taylor's butt. This is Taylor that's filming it. I'm David, and these are some tips and tricks you can use if you have a dog that has separation anxiety.